you know at what point? Oh, sorry. Uh, I can start now. I can start later. Let let me know at what point I should. All right. Um, so uh, tonight, what I want to give you is a uh, some insight into a big problem that occurs if you try to do quantum mechanics on a classical computer, and hence uh, one of the uh, driving motivations for attempts to build a quantum computer. So I'll start off by uh, describing why we want to do quantum mechanics on a computer. Uh, that is, why don't we just, you know, be uh, uh, grown-ups about it and, and uh, uh, roll up our sleeves and do quantum mechanics analytically. Let me remind you of um, uh, what happens. You know, we, we can do that to some extent. For example, you probably have all seen the solution of the hydrogen atom. You write down Schrodinger's equation. I guess maybe John wrote it down for um, a square well and a, a quantum oscillator. Here it is for the hydrogen atom. Uh, you have an electron, a single electron moving in um, three dimensions, uh, and we describe it with polar coordinates, r, theta, and phi, and we try to solve this differential equation. And you can do it. Uh, the solution is already a little bit heavy. It involves these Laguerre polynomials and spherical harmonics and so on. And you get these energy levels, the hydrogenic energy levels, which beautifully explain the uh, color of light that uh, is emitted from, from atoms. But uh, the problem with this is you can't take this even one step further. That is, you cannot solve the helium atom with two electrons analytically. It's just impossible. In fact, um, hold on just one second. Oh, sorry, well, I, I can't find it, but I have a, uh, a book by uh, Hans Bethe, you know, one of the uh, most profound thinkers in quantum mechanics. It's uh, three or 400 pages long, and it's about trying to solve the helium atom. And basically, he concludes that uh, can't be done. Um, and this was written 20 or 30 years after the first discovery of quantum mechanics, but it's still completely true today. Can't, can't do that problem analytically, pencil and paper. So what that tells us is that we can't really understand chemistry, you know, molecules with a few dozen electrons, and we certainly can't um, look at the properties of solids with 10 to the 23rd electrons. So we can't analytically understand magnetism or metal insulator transitions in solids or superconductivity or, or any of that good stuff. So, uh, you know, of course, when we're stuck with uh, analytic solutions, we often uh, just turn to a computer. And if our problem were to uh, look at the motion of hundreds of classical particles uh, described by Newton's equations, F equal MA, we would just write down F equals MA and do molecular dynamics or something, and, and we, could, uh, we could really kill that problem. Let's, uh, let's see what's involved, however, with trying to do quantum mechanics on a computer. So, uh, what we're going to try to do is uh, not solve the Schrodinger equation here. Rather, I'm going to try to do a statistical mechanics, quantum statistical mechanics. Let me remind you, um, uh, what I'm going to do particularly first is, is do the quantum statistical mechanics of uh, the single quantum oscillator. Uh, th that particular problem, we, know, we do know how to do analytically, that just one particle problem. We know the energy levels, I think, uh, John reviewed these for you, maybe even including anharmonicity. Uh, without any anharmonicity, the uh, quantum oscillator levels are equally spaced by h bar omega, and the lowest one is one half h bar omega. You can calculate the partition function, which is just the sum over all the levels of e to the minus beta e sub n. Incidentally, is my cursor um, appearing to you? Yeah, we can okay. see it. OK, good. Um, and uh, you can calculate that actually pretty easily because the energy levels are equally spaced. It ends up being just a, um, a geometric sum that you need to do. 
and you, so you can calculate the partition function. And uh, incidentally, uh, my symbol beta here is one over Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. Once you have the partition function, there's this uh, handy formula which allows you to get the average energy. We have a, an oscillator in contact with a heat bath at temperature T. So it, it sort of populates all the different levels with certain probabilities. You can calculate the average energy as it moves around between these levels by taking the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function with respect to beta. And if you do that, you just get the ground state energy, one half h bar omega plus h bar omega times the famous uh, Bose-Einstein distribution function. Uh, I'm you know, not uh, doing that too slowly. You can, can go ahead and verify that I did the math right. And in particular, there are two interesting limits. You can take beta goes to infinity, t goes to zero, then this Bose factor goes to zero and the energy just becomes the ground state energy. If you crank the temperature way down, the uh, quantum os oscillator just sits for sure in the ground state and the energy is just one half h bar omega. On the other hand, if you let beta get really dinky, the temperature goes to infinity, you can show that um, the average energy approaches KBT, the classical answer that the equipartition theorem will give you. So, we know how to solve for the partition function of the quantum os oscillator, uh, but let's, uh, let's see how to do that um, using Monte Carlo, uh, even though we, we can do it. So I wanted to review some basic quantum mechanical principles which will enter our solution, but I think you've seen these in classes and maybe last quarter with John. Um, some, some of the principles that we're going to be uh, making use of are the fact that you know, if you have an observable, anything you want to measure in a quantum mechanical system, uh, to every observable is associated a particular Hermitian operator, a particular matrix. And the possible results of measurements of that observable are the eigenvalues of the associated operator or matrix. A particular state uh, of the physical system, that is, a description of its properties, classically that would be maybe the position and velocity of the particle, is a vector. And the way that the state of the physical system uh, evolves in time, the way this vector changes with time is given by the Schrodinger equation. The derivative of the vector describing the state of the physical uh, system with respect to time is given by this operator that's associated with the energy times the wave function. So you probably know that, uh, you know, not even necessarily from quantum mechanics, but just a course in linear algebra or something, it's very important to distinguish a vector, uh, an arrow in space, from the components of the vector. The latter, the components of the vector, depend on the basis. So let's uh, look at that statement in the context of an arrow in space. We have this uh, red arrow V, and if we choose a particular coordinate system, some axes and basis vectors I and J, you can write the vector V. I'm using uh, some quantum mechanics notation for vectors um, to make the connection more uh, clear. You can write the vector V as a linear combination of the basis vectors I and J, and there are components, V1 and V2. Those components depend on your choice of basis. I've chosen a basis which has a horizontal and vertical axes, but I could tilt those, I could rotate them. My vector V wouldn't change if I rotated my basis, but the components would change. Almost always we use basis vectors which are orthonormal, so i and j, when you take their dot product, you get zero. Whereas if you take the dot product of the basis vectors i and j with each other, uh, with, with the same vector, you get one. The reason that's mathematically so convenient is that it gives us a nice way to extract the components v1 and v2 from the vector 
in particular, to get the first component, you just take the dot product of the vector with the first basis vector. To get the second component, you just take the dot product of the vector V with the second basis vector. So using that uh, prescription, we can rewrite the formula for V as an expansion with V1 and V2. We can plug in what we know V1 and V2 are, namely the dot products of V with the corresponding uh, basis vectors. And if you just stare at that for a minute, you'll notice that the vector of V can be written as this sort of strange I, I plus J, J times the vector V. And what that tells us is that this matrix here, I, I plus J, J is in fact just the identity matrix. So that V is the identity matrix times V. I've reviewed that because it helps us to understand some of the basic manipulations that we do when we do quantum mechanics. In particular, if you're given a quantum mechanical state vector psi, you can represent it with any basis you choose. In particular, you can choose the basis of all the eigenstates of the position operator. So here's my position operator. It has some eigenvectors so that when I act with the position operator on an eigenvector, I get the same vector back again times the eigenvalue. I know that the eigenvectors of the position operator can be used to form a basis. Does someone know why I know that the eigenvectors of the position operator are a complete set and can be used to form a basis? Is it because it's invertible? It's in, because X is invertible. Um, that's a good point. It may not be the... Um, or it's Hermitian. It's Hermitian, yeah, right. So to any observable associated Hermitian operator, and one of the things you learn, I think, in you know Math 22B or something, is that Hermitian operators have complete sets of eigenvectors. In fact, they're not only complete sets, but luckily they're also orthonormal. So they're just exactly what we want for all the math to be sort of simple. Uh, unfortunately, the, the thing that makes quantum mechanics a lot harder than vectors in a plane is that there are an infinite number of eigenvectors of the position operator. The space we're working in is infinite dimensional. So we acknowledge that by integrating over all the infinite number of eigenvectors. But all I've written down here, you can think about it if you haven't seen it before, I've just generalized the fact that, I just generalized this equation here for V to an analysis, analogous equation for psi. Now I, I tried to emphasize that I can use any um, basis that I want. So here I'm using the eigenvectors of the position operator as my basis, but I could also use the eigenstates of the momentum operator as my basis. Uh, the components uh, psi of x would be different if I used the rotated momentum basis. But one thing that's really uh, important for us to understand is how to go back and forth between the position basis and the momentum basis, because I'm going to be using that in my solution of the quantum harmonic oscillator. And the basic identity is that if you ask yourself, what is the wave function of an eigenstate of the momentum operator, P, so the uh, components are these dot products, X and P, they're nothing but a plane wave e to the i px. So the component of an eigenstate of the momentum operator in the basis of position operators are these phases e to the i px. We're going to use that equation. Is that, I, I don't know, let's see how I can, um, I think I can't see, oh, maybe I can see, um, 
Is that helpful or is that to everybody? Can you raise your hands if like you know and love that equation? I won't say I love it, but I know it. You know it? Okay, Miranda, Miranda and Saud. Okay, a few people are, are waving at me. All right, so I apologize for all that review. Let's now uh, do something um, maybe new and different, which is to solve the harmonic oscillator with computer. What we're gonna do is learn how to write uh, Feynman's path integral formulation of the quantum oscillator instead of the Schrodinger or the Heisenberg approach to quantum mechanics. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna show um, a, the simplest possible example of the fact that you can always map a d-dimensional quantum statistical mechanics problem onto a d plus one dimensional classical statistical mechanics problem. So statistical mechanics is all about calculating the partition function. The partition function, before I wrote it as a sum over n, but more generally you can talk about taking the trace of e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian operator. That's what you need to do to calculate the statistical mechanics of a quantum mechanical system. And a trace you can do, you know, in any basis you want. The trace is independent of the choice of basis. And remember what the trace is. It's the sum of the diagonal elements of the matrix. So the diagonal elements of the matrix mean MII or if we have this infinite dimensional space, we take the x1, x1 element of our matrix and we sum over all of those. Now, we have a bit of a problem here because uh, we sort of know how uh, the position operator acts on one of these position vectors but we can't really uh, separate the momentum and position operators in the quantum uh, oscillator uh, because you know, I think, that the exponential of the sum of two numbers is just the product of the exponentials. But if you have operators, the exponential of the sum of two operators is most definitely not the product of the exponential of the operators. That's because the operators X and P don't commute. But I don't know if you've thought about this, um, even though this is not an equality, if beta is really dinky, this uh, equation is almost true. So if we were at high temperatures, we could separate E to the minus beta H into its two pieces, the kinetic and potential energies. This gives us a bold idea. Our idea is, why don't we break up e to the minus beta h into a bunch of little pieces, e to the minus tau h, e to the minus tau h, e to the minus tau h. That is, we divide beta, the full inverse temperature, into a bunch of small increments, capital L small intervals tau. Then we have a small parameter tau, and we are permitted to break up the exponential of tau h into the product of the exponentials of kinetic and potential energies. So here we go. We have this e to the minus beta h, which is intractable. We divide it up into a bunch of e to the minus tau h's. And then remember we have the um, identity operator in the language of vectors in a plane, it was just this simple thing, but in quantum mechanics, it's a big integral over different, uh, all the different eigenstates of the position operator. So let me back up just one second and point out that we're doing statistical, quantum statistical mechanics so we have this operator e to the minus beta h. But if John were doing uh, uh, the evolution of a wave function for us, the way he did it back in the spring, he was telling you about the operator e to the minus i time times h. And if you stare at those two things, 
you'll notice that, of course, they look very similar. They both involve exponentials of the Hamiltonian. But in the one case, you have i times t, the time. In the other case, you have beta, the inverse temperature. So one often, and I will do this here, use the language that beta is imaginary time because it literally is appearing exactly the same way as i t does in solving the time evolution of a wave function. OK, so uh, I should, uh, I'm talking fast and not giving you the opportunity to ask any questions. But maybe I will pause for a minute and see if there are some questions. Professor, I do have a question. Yes. Which is, um, do, do you suggest any materials uh, for people who are beginning to uh, read quantum mechanics or quantum computing? Well, I will suggest materials for what I'm particularly talking about. Um, and I sent those to uh, Miranda. And she is, um, I think, going to forward them to you either by finding their web links, or maybe she'll just send you the PDFs. So I'm, I'm going to punt on the question of telling you generally how to um, good uh, resources for quantum computing. But I'm going to answer the question more narrowly, which is to give you two, I think, just amazing resources for what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, they really are. I think um, you could argue that uh, what Miranda will forward to you, um, an article by Michael Kreutz, and uh, I forget Friedman's first name. It really is sort of the, the paper that started out Quantum Monte Carlo. So it's just, uh, you know, an amazing paper. And they do um, the quantum harmonic oscillator. And uh, it goes way past what I'm going to do here, of course because it tells you how to do the Monte Carlo, which I'm not going to try to describe. Mm -hmm. And then the second paper is uh, more, a lot more sophisticated. It's by John Kogut on uh, an introduction to lattice gauge theories and spin systems. But what's fantastic about it is, you know, you might, I mean, I'm sort of afraid of lattice gauge theory. You know, it's this, this crazy complicated high energy theory stuff. Uh, but, um, this, this uh, paper by Kogut puts all of, well, not all of, but, but puts lattice gauge theory in the context of like the Heisenberg model and the Ising model. And so, you know, if you're familiar with condensed matter theory, it's a beautiful way to become familiar with uh, lattice gauge theory, sort of deep, complicated, high energy theory. So mm -hmm. I'm also a huge fan of that paper by Kogut. Got it. I, sub okay. I submitted both links on the under the chat. Um, yeah, uh, we also had a question from I think Robomzi who asked if you could briefly summarize the partition function for those of us who aren't familiar with it. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, if um, yeah, you're sort of asking me to, to teach you statistical mechanics, but let me let me try. Um, and let me try by, um, hold on just one second here. So can you see this Google Doc thing here? Yep. Okay. So um,
So here's the basic uh, idea of um, statistical mechanics. It's actually not too complicated. If you have some system and you know the energy levels, E sub n, then there's something called the partition function, which is just a sum over all the energy levels of the exponential of negative the energy over Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. And if you manage to, to calculate that, If you're successful in calculating the partition function, man, you're, you're done. You're a master of the universe. Um, you can get anything you want about this system. For example, if you want the average energy, you know, you have these energy levels, but they have different populations. If you want to calculate the average energy, just take the uh, partition function, take its logarithm, take a derivative with respect to beta and stick a minus sign. I use that fact uh, on page one or two of my notes. So th that's uh, a lightning introduction to statistical mechanics. Let me invite you to do the following problem. All right, so I invite you to do the following problem. I do the statistical mechanics of a classical oscillator. What are the energy levels of a classical oscillator? It's one half kx squared, the potential energy plus one half mv squared, the kinetic energy. X and V can be any numbers from minus infinity to infinity. And so the partition function is just a sum over all those levels. The levels are labeled by these continuous variables X and V. You do those two integrals to get the partition function, uh, you, you, um, you, you can do that. And then, uh, you know, um, calculate the average energy, show that it's KBT and you have proven you'll have proven a powerful theorem in statistical mechanics, namely that every quadratic degree of freedom in the energy contributes one half KBT to the average energy. We have two quadratic terms in the energy, each contribute one half KBT and that's, that's the uh, equipartition theory. I'll, I'll send uh, Miranda some notes uh, which are, I prepared which are um, an introduction to statistical mechanics and uh, she can share that with you. Well, so I hope that was a little bit helpful, but you know, StatMech is a one quarter course, right? I'm gonna continue on, may I? Go ahead. All right, so, um, so here we are, we, uh, we had this brilliant conception of uh, dividing up beta into a bunch of little increments. So we did that. And now I'm gonna 
stick the identity matrix between every single one of these e to the minus tau h's. And I can, you know, you can stick the identity matrix anywhere you want because, you know, it doesn't change anything to stick one in different places. So I originally just had one integral over dx, which was from the trace, but now I have a bunch of integrals because I'm going to put all these identity matrices everywhere. And now I'm going to use my uh, nice approximation that because tau is tiny, I can break up the exponential of the kinetic plus the potential energy operators into just the product of the exponentials. Now you might uh, be mad at me to, you know, because I'm making an approximation here, but I want to emphasize that it's a controlled approximation. That is, I can make tau smaller and smaller and smaller and get cl as close as I want to the exact answer. It's like, you know, when you do a, um, uh, a numerical integral using the trapezoidal rule, yeah, it's approximation, but you can get as accurate a value for the integral as you want by just making the base of your trapezoids smaller and smaller. So I'm saying it's an approximation, but really in some sense, it's not because I can just take the limit tau goes to zero and get the exact answer. Okay, now what have we accomplished here? Well, because we've isolated the position operator X, remember the position operator acts on an eigenstate and the operator just gets replaced by its eigenvalue. I blitzed through that, but this blue equation here, it's the defining uh, nature of an eigenvector of the position operator that the operator just gets replaced by the eigenvalue. So I'm just going to replace in every one of these terms, let's take this one here that connects x2 and x3, I'll replace this position operator by its eigenvalue x2. So I claim that we've accomplished something really nice. We have got rid of we're on the road to getting rid of our operators, uh, getting rid of quantum mechanics. We've gotten rid of all the position operators. Every single one of these position operators can act on its associated vector and get replaced by a number. Of course, we still have these messy momentum operators. So let's look at that. After we replace the uh, position operator by its eigenvalue, we have these momentum operators. Well, you know, you might guess that uh, the way to get rid of the momentum operator is by introducing the momentum eigenstates. So we can do that too. We insert I, the identity operator here. And now I'm going to use my little review for you that the overlap, the wave function of a momentum eigenstate in the position vector, in the position space, is just e to the i p x l. This momentum operator now hits the momentum eigenvector, and the operator gets replaced by the eigenvalue. I'm left with p x l plus 1, but I also know what that is. It's just this plane wave. Well, it's the complex conjugate, so I have this minus sign. So I've evaluated this matrix element of the momentum operator between these two position states. It's this quantity. And well, I just talked when I was trying to review stat mech for you, I just mentioned Gaussian integrals. This is a Gaussian integral over P. P is just a number now, no operator. You do this Gaussian integral by completing the square. I hope you've seen that somewhere. You take the thing that's up in the exponential and you add and subtract a quantity so that the P appears as a square of something. And then you have this leftover thing that you had to subtract off to uh, take care of the thing that you added in to make it a complete square. So I'm going to ask you to check my algebra here, but we now have an integral over uh, a Gaussian, which is just shifted, 
and you know that Gaussian integral can be done. I actually now have a little error here. There's an overall factor of the square root of pi over the square root of two m pi over tau, which I left out because it's just a constant multiple, so it's irrelevant to the partition function. But I really should have put it in there. This quantity that you have to subtract off when you complete the square. Uh, I realize this is very fast, but it's actually sort of pleasing physically because this quantity that you have is the difference in the position from L to L plus one divided by the imaginary time. It's sort of like a velocity, the difference of position over the difference in imaginary time times one half M. So the upshot of this uh, beautiful calculation is that we started off with a quantum oscillator and we've written the partition function for it as a completely classical expression. No operators appear in this blue box. The partition function involves L classical integrals the exponential of negative something I'm calling S, which depends on X1 through XL. And here's my S. The S has two pieces. It has the pieces that arrive when I got rid of the position operators. And then it has these new pieces that arise from getting rid of the momentum operators. And this, again, looks sort of nice because it sort of has a potential energy looking thing, one half m omega squared x squared. And it also has a kinetic energy looking thing, one half m v squared. But the important thing to emphasize is we have a classical integral that we need to do to solve our quantum mechanical problem. Does anyone know why I've used this symbol S here? Is it related to the entropy? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good guess, but that's wrong. Do you know what else in physics we use S for besides entropy? Spin. So if you took a classical mechanics course, you might use S for the arc, I don't know, arc length. <laughs> arc length. That's another thing you use S for. Uh, use S for the action uh, in a classical mechanics course. And the action is the difference between the kinetic energy and the, the potential energy and the kinetic energy. It's the difference. We have a sum here. I'll leave it to you to figure out why we have a sum instead of a difference. But let me, let me give you the big picture here of what we've done. We started out with a single quantum harmonic oscillator. It had operators X and P. There are no indices on these things. So it's a zero dimensional quantum mechanics problem. And we've mapped it onto a chain of classical harmonic oscillators. We have these integral over this collection of X sub L's the X has one index. It's a one dimensional classical problem. So this is world's simplest illustration of a very important and general principle that you can always take always any quantum mechanics problem in D dimensions and map it onto a classical problem in one higher dimension. So if you hear some, uh, big shot trying to snow you and saying, oh, I'm doing quantum Monte Carlo, uh, aren't I uh, great? Well, uh, the secret behind that statement is that quantum Monte Carlo is just classical Monte Carlo in one higher dimension. So uh, because we know, uh, well, maybe you've seen classical Monte Carlo, this suggests that we can always do quantum Monte Carlo for any problem in quantum mechanics by just doing classical Monte Carlo in one higher dimension. 
Classical Monte Carlo can certainly be done on a classical computer. And I'm not gonna tell you what classical Monte Carlo is, but this sort of suggests that we're really in business to do quantum mechanics on a classical computer. Just go through this mapping and uh, do classical Monte Carlo. I was gonna give you, I, I think I can pull this off. Um, this is gonna be pretty fast. So I'm saying I'm gonna accelerate now that we have the basic ideas in place. I'm gonna show you how to do a one dimensional quantum problem by mapping it onto a two dimensional classical problem. So the one dimensional quantum problem I'm gonna do is the so-called easing model in a transverse field. So instead of having just uh, one variable, x hat, one quantum variable, I have a family of variables, these Pauli matrices, Pauli operators, they are a family, they're indexed by this index i, which runs from one to n. I imagine I have n spatial sites. On each site sits a Pauli operator, and not only a Pauli operator in the z direction, but also Pauli operators in the x and y direction. And because I have both z and x, and you know the Pauli matrices don't commute with each other, I'm in the same situation as I was in the quantum oscillator where I have X and P that don't commute. So this is a really famous model. It's called the Ising model, the one dimensional Ising model in a transverse field. Why is it famous? What is its physics? Well, this first term, which couples the Z components of the spin on different sites it favors lining up the Z components of spin on all the different sites in the same direction. It would like a ground state where all of the Z components point in the Z direction parallel to each other. On the other hand, this B term, this magnetic field term, it tries to rotate the quantum mechanical spins to point along the X direction. So there's a fight between these two terms, lining up in the z direction or lining up in the x direction. And there is a quantum phase transition, a zero temperature phase transition that takes place between these two ground states as you change the ratio of j to b. I'll say a bit more about why this is a phase transition that occurs at zero temperature and what that means precisely. Okay, what I need to do is just the exact analog of the steps that I performed for the quantum harmonic oscillator. So I need to take the trace of e to the minus beta h. What I did before was I put x1 and x1 on the, uh, as to extract the diagonal elements to get the trace. I'll do the same thing here, except because I have a family of operators, I'm using the symbol sigma one, but really let's remember that sigma one actually, sigma L equals one actually has a collection of sites, site one, site two, site three, up to site N, all on the same time slice L. So this is a shorthand symbol for a much longer vector. But I take the trace by plastering the same vector to the right and left of e to the minus beta h. That's how you get a trace. I'll subdivide the inverse temperature into a bunch of little intervals. And then I'll, that was something I did for the quantum oscillator. And then I'll play again the same game as for the quantum oscillator. I'll insert the identity matrix everywhere between these exponential of minus tau h's. So I have, as in the quantum oscillator, this imaginary time index, one, two, up to L. But remember that that's just one of my indices. I have an imaginary time index 
But each of these vectors, which has this imaginary time index hidden inside is also a spatial index. So these sigma variables, they have a space index that I started with in my quantum problem and also an additional imaginary time index. So you already get a glimmering for the fact that my one dimensional quantum mechanics problem has picked up a second index. So I'm getting a two dimensional classical problem. I think I'm you know, getting close to an hour. So I'm, I'm just gonna ask you to look at these notes if you're interested, but I'll just say that I am faced with the exact same problem as I was faced with when I did the quantum oscillator, I need to evaluate these matrix elements. And it's actually not that hard to do, but it's, you know, it's performing the analog of that completing the square thing and so on. And you can do it, it's in these nodes. And the bottom line is in this blue box here, just as uh, my classical, uh, sorry, my quantum oscillator ended up being a collection of L classical operators. Here also my one dimensional quantum problem ends up being a where am I? Oops, I went a little bit too far. The partition function of this one dimensional quantum problem maps onto a statistical mechanics problem, which is a classical easing model in two dimensions. And there's a coupling J in the space direction, it couples classical spins on the same time slice, but different spatial sites. And then there's another term which couples the same spatial site, but couples you in the time direction. So the problem I started with, the one dimensional quantum icing model through this path integral that Feynman discovered maps onto the two-dimensional classical easing model. And now let me tell you something remarkable. The two-dimensional classical easing model, it can be solved. It actually is not that easy. Um, the easing model you might know was proposed like in 1912, and it was 40 years later before Ansager discovered how to solve it. Uh, but it is soluble, and it has a phase transition which occurs the phase transition occurs only in the thermodynamic limit. Namely, you have to have an infinite number of easing variables in space and in time. So what this tells us is that we can solve the quantum easing model in one dimension by mapping it onto the classical easing model in two dimensions. But this condition that the classical model has to be in the thermodynamic limit, it has to have infinite dimension. It tells us that both n, the number of quantum sites that we had, and beta, the number of time slices, have to be infinite. The fact that beta is infinite to get this phase transition tells us that, remember, beta is the inverse of the temperature. The fact that beta is infinite tells us that the temperature is zero. So again, I know I'm going super fast, but if you've heard this phrase, a quantum phase transition, you now know a little bit about why a quantum phase transition occurs at t equals zero. It's because phase transitions require that you be in the thermodynamic limit. The thermodynamic limit means infinite extent beta has to be infinite, you have to be at t equals zero, zero temperature. Okay, 
So I think I'm close to being done. I guess this is my last page. Um, so seemingly all is well. I've, I've given you this, um, this pathway to do any quantum statistical mechanics problem. We can uh, solve the helium atom, the, the, we can solve uh, solid state physics and look at magnetism and superconductivity and metal insulator transitions. We just take that quantum problem that we have started out with, we map it onto a D plus one dimensional classical problem. We do classical Monte on a classical computer and there is absolutely no need in the world for us ever to want to have a quantum computer. Now that's all a big lie because unfortunately, if you try to do this mapping, I've told you in quite a bit of detail how to do the mapping for a quantum oscillator. And we went through lightning fast how to do the mapping for the one dimensional transverse field icing model. Both of those ended up being nice classical stat net problems. If you try the same thing, it's not that hard to write down actually. Um, if you try to do the exact same thing for electrons, you find that the analog of this e to the minus s and the e to the minus energy that you get, it's not positive. You can't use it as a probability for your classical Monte Carlo. This fact is called the sign problem and it's a showstopper for doing quantum systems on a classical computer. You can't do classical Monte Carlo because the thing you want to use as a probability goes negative. So we do need quantum computers to do quantum statistical mechanics. So I apologize for that being so fast, but at least I finished in an hour and uh, I'm certainly happy to answer questions now or by email later. It worked, Professor Scalador. So if there's any questions, uh, don't be afraid to unmute yourself. Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sending that resource here, um, that paper by uh, John, another John, I guess, um, an introduction to uh, lattice gauge theory. I thought that was um, uh, particularly neat. Uh, I remember, um, I think a year or two ago, um, there was a paper that came out uh, over an attempt to um, try and simulate certain um, quantum chromodynamics based systems um, on uh, something similar or akin to um, an easing model uh, on some of the D wave machines, you know, with the uh, uh, AQC method. But at the time, I was uh, uh, unaware uh, of exactly what um, lattice gauge theory was. It went over my head. This is a, a wonderful resource. So thank you so much for sharing it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've, I've talked about the easing model here where the spins live on the sites of a lattice. The uh, easing model um, has this discrete symmetry. If you flip all the spins, from up to down, there are two possible um, ground states, all up or all down. But it's a discrete symmetry. There are only just two choices. What you'll find in this article by Kogut is he describes an easing model where the easing variables live not on the sites of the lattice, but on the bonds of the lattice. And that, um, that model um, has a local symmetry. And so it has a huge number of degenerate ground states. There's a, a local, he calls it a gauge symmetry, uh, but it's, it's a lot like it's, you know, when you do real QCD, you have quark fields on the sites of your lattice and your uh, vector bosons, the W bosons and Z bosons, the quarks live on the links of the lattice. And I don't, I don't understand any of that really, but I certainly understand the easing model. And if you read this paper by Kogut, you will see that these easing variables living on the links of the lattice have this really close conceptual connection to um, uh, uh, gauge fields, uh, uh, quarks, uh, sorry, gluons 
living on the links of the lattice connecting the quarks on the sites. Oh, wow. That's, uh... So I'm trying to sell you on COVID, why you should read the COVID article. <laughs> oh, no, uh, most definitely. Uh, it's a uh, uh, wonderful resource. So thank you for sharing it. Um, so I, I don't know if I might have missed it, but considering this is a lot of information that you packed into one hour. Um, but when you're actually partitioning out, um, I think this was in the slides, what was it like seven or eight? When you're partitioning out to then uh, make it equivalent to your um, classical model, why yeah. do we do that partition? I might have missed it when you mentioned it, but why is that important? Why is... Uh, um, doing this mapping from a quantum problem onto a classical problem important? Is that what you're asking? Uh, more specifically, the, so you mentioned in what, yeah, I guess that'd actually, that would be the, that'd be the actual question, yeah. Yeah, so um, the reason is that um, if you think about, you know, doing Monte Carlo, you're supposed to take some, you know, degrees of freedom, you know, the face of a die or whatever, and you're supposed to, um, you know, use probabilities to generate configurations and so on and so forth. I don't know what those words mean if I have operators hanging around. I know what those means if I have real numbers around. I know how to generate real random real numbers, and but I have no idea how to do um, Monte Carlo with operators. So, I, in fact, nobody does. Um, so what people always do is they take their quantum problem, which has operators, and they map it onto a classical problem, which just has numbers. The price you pay is it's one higher dimension. But the great thing is that then you're able to do Monte Carlo because no operators, just numbers. So that's why I put this red heart here. I've gotten rid of all the operators. I'm no longer a quantum mechanics person. I'm just a uh, numbers guy. And I know how to, I know how to do Monte Carlo um, for numbers. So I'm happy, except at the end of the day, I'm very unhappy because I do get something that just involves numbers, but it goes negative on me. So I'm not happy. I see. Thank you. So it is seven. You're not, no one is forced to stay here after seven. We, um, we thank you for coming here. If you need to leave, we understand. Uh, but if there's any more questions, please uh, feel free to ask. We might continue for by another five or 10 more minutes. Oh, the participant list is shrinking. It's always fun to watch that. <laughs> Hey, Professor. Yeah. Uh, uh, one question I had was um, when you're doing the, if you've ever done computation for uh, the statistical models, um, do you aim for any specific type of uh, classical computing architecture, like uh, CPU optimized or, or GPU optimized uh, um, towards the calculations, or do you uh, usually just take like does any is any of that really fine for oh if you yeah. want to be a uh uh if you want to do um, monte carlo at the highest level you better um be willing to make use of uh the most advanced hardware um so yeah uh, the people who are the best in the world at classical and quantum monte carlo are putting their um codes on multi-core uh, CPUs and uh, GPUs. So in fact, one of my projects in my group right now is my graduate student, um, Ben Coenstead, has written a very nice code in Julia to do quantum Monte Carlo for electrons and lattice vibrations in a solid. And we've hooked up with uh, this group at Oak Ridge National Lab that are expert at putting such codes onto GPUs. So we are hoping that um, they're gonna help us do that and make our code super fast. Nice.
Nice. That sounds like a like an awesome uh, piece of work. Um, but you don't you don't have any specific. Um, well, I guess you wouldn't need to really have any specific optimization for lattice structure if you're sticking with one dimension or two dimension of the actual oh. CPU device, right? Yeah, what Ben has done, he's written a really nice code. It's only on CPUs for now, but he's written a general geometry code. So um, uh, all you really need to know to do um, these calculations is you need to have a list of all the neighbors of any of your sites. So um, he's written his code in such a way that if you provide it with a list of the neighbors of each site, it can uh, go from there. So his code can do 1D lattices. It can do 2D lattices, triangular, honeycomb, triang uh, square. It can do 3D lattices, you know, cubic, monoclinic, base centered cubic. Uh, you just have to change the neighbor table. Wow, and is this uh, like, uh, publicly available anywhere, or is this just uh, for the project that, that you're working on? Oh, uh, yeah, we haven't um, we haven't posted this particular code. We do have a code that does um, interacting electron systems with general geometry. I'll uh, I'll send that to um, uh, Miranda as well. Um, so it's it's a code which tries to solve as well as can be solved interacting electrons in a solid. But as I uh, said, um, it runs into the sign problem. So it, uh, it poops out at some point um, and it, 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 can, it can do certain cases, but um, it can't do everything. Makes sense, thanks a lot. If there are no more questions, uh, I have a quick question for you, Professor Scouter. Um, yes. Would you be fine with me sending your email out with our, our next email with all the information? Say that one more time, Miranda. Are you fine with us sending your email out or should they um, come to us to uh, ask questions? Uh, that, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, yeah, please do send my email out. And I'll say one more thing. Maybe I should have said this when we had 20 people, but um, I am going to be, uh, it's not a course, but um, just sort of a, a research meeting next quarter winter on doing classical Monte Carlo. So I realize this is a quantum group, but um, that's one thing that'll be happening next quarter. And, uh, you know, uh, folks who are interested would be welcome to, uh, to join that. Great. Um, I think there's no more questions, actually. Uh, well, I want to say we're at ending the meeting. Thank you, Professor Scalander, for presenting. This is very interesting. And um, well, <laughs> there might be a couple more questions heading your way after this is all said and done. Okay, you're most welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>